Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I was about to say good morning. That would have been inaccurate. <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us on this Thursday afternoon. We will have people popping in, I know, here for the next few minutes, but let me just give a brief intro. For those of you who are not aware of what Metro Council is, um, Metro Council is a group made up of the community mental health centers that serve the greatest, greater Kansas City area. And we came together years ago to create this coalition to provide education and information to the greater Kansas City area as a cooperative because um, we just felt like it was better working together than working all individually in that way. In addition to putting on our annual live um, mental health Casey conference, which is generally in May, we also do a fall symposium, which our last one was just a couple of weeks ago. And then we do these uh, free webinars uh, twice a month, unless the holiday stops us from doing that. And so it's just an opportunity again for us to be able to, to, to give into the community um, the people who present, like Autumn, uh, do so voluntarily, and they are greatly appreciated. Uh, we have a, a very wide variety of, of topics, so I invite you to check out the mentalhealthkc.com uh, website just to keep abreast of those things. You can join an email list, and uh, just so you're always aware of what's going on there. My name is Carl Anderson. I am the Director of Regional Affairs at Comprehensive Mental Health um, Burl Behavioral Health and it is my pleasure to be able to host today. I don't wanna take a lot of Autumn's time, so I'm not gonna read her entire bio to you. I just wanna introduce her. She is a veteran of the US Navy and has served as a master at arms, um, which is also known as military police. She was stationed, stationed overseas in London and then in Jacksonville, Florida. And she is here to talk to us um, in a very at a very timely time with Veterans Day coming up. So I will just allow her to share more about herself as she wants to and begin our presentation. I will say just as one member thing of housekeeping, we will have a Q&A after this, but please feel free to put your questions in the chat as we're going along so that way you don't have to remember them. And when it comes to that point, I will um, manage that and get those questions to Autumn and we'll answer as many as we can. Also, if for some reason you're having some kind of difficulties or individual issues, please feel free to DM me in the chat as well during the presentation. You probably have noticed that you can't see yourself or anyone else. We do that in order to make sure that with the number of people we have on there that our uh, service doesn't lag um, because we've had that issue before. So it's, yeah, nothing's wrong with your set. <laughs> it is just what it is. Um, if you need to chat or, or do anything, please do so in the chat box. And I welcome you, Autumn, and turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Carl. It's very nice to meet you. And thank you for that wonderful introduction. And if you don't mind, sometimes I lose track of time. So if you could just keep me on a time schedule, that would be very much appreciated. Okay. Hi, I'm Autumn Ray. I am a therapist at Beacon Mental Health. Beacon Mental Health has formerly Tri-County Mental Health. And we just did a rebranding at the beginning of October. And we're really excited about all of the new things and still same services, just new opportunities. And we're really excited for that. So thank you so much for spending your afternoon lunchtime with me. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my presentation right now. All right. Can you guys see it? Yeah, it's on. Okay, great. Okay, so yes, um, as Carl was sharing, it is November 9th. In a few days, it's going to be November 11th. Um, it is a perfect time to sit down and um, just kind of make a mention to our, our military veterans and have an opportunity to, you know, kind of understand military culture. Um, you know, I, I was in the military. I spent five years in the Navy. The transition from a civilian to a military active duty person to a civilian again was very scary and challenging, uh, which is why this again is so important to have this information. All right, so some of the objectives is again, just military introduction, resources prior to and after separation from the military, community resources in the Kansas City area, 
just again, mental health and veterans, because as again, we're transitioning from, you know, all these different changes, obviously mental health has a huge impact in our daily living activities. And then just some additional resources. I am going to do my, I'm, I want to make this available for you because I have so many resources within this presentation. And then I also have an additional Word document that I would also like to share with you guys, just with resources here locally in Kansas City, but then also um, just within the United States, just websites and resources that you guys can have easy access to. These are the crests of the military branches. We have the United States Army, United States Navy, we have the US Coast Guard, the Air Force, and we have the United States Marine Corps. Now, these emblems, you know, you can see them on the uniforms. That's kind of how you can differentiate between the different branches. I'm not expecting you to remember them. So if you see an active duty um, personnel and they're wearing their uniform and they have the, their emblem on the uniform, that's kind of how you can differentiate what branch that they're a part of. And sometimes you'll see veterans wear hats that have these emblems on them as well, um, just for your information. So yes, Carl did a wonderful brief introduction to who I am. I was uh, 19 years old when I joined the military. I came from a small town here in Kansas City and joined the big military. Um, it was quite overwhelming. Um, I, my first duty station, okay, so from my small Kansas City hometown, joined the military, um, went to boot camp in, in Great Lakes, Chicago, and my schedule is very much dictated, always had something to do 24 hours a day. Then after my boot camp, I went to what the military calls as an A school, or some people will call a C school, or some people will call MOS school, which is my job. I was trained to be a police officer in Little Creek, Virginia, spent some time there. And then after that, my first duty station was overseas in London, England. And I was, a, again, I was a police officer. The, the Navy calls them master at arms. And, you know, we just did police work. We did, you know, uh, like security for different things and events that were happening within our command. Um, we did patrols. We did um, like physical security access. And we did random anti-terrorism measures and made sure that, you know, that we were safe and our commands were safe. Had a, had a good time. I was... One of the, I was the lead dispatcher um, on July 5th of 2005. I don't know if you guys remember this specifically, but there was four bombs that went off that day. We were, we're so the military has an agreement with the Ministry of Defense um, overseas in the United Kingdom. We're so, so we're supposed to work one-on-one -on -one with Ministry of Defense police. And so I'm working my dispatch section, the Ministry of Defense police officers work in his, and we're watching the news, obviously, for breaking news in case anything happens. And we are under the impression that two trains collided, two of the, the tubes, we call them tubes, trains under the ground were, were had collided. And we were just like, oh my gosh, devastated. We didn't know what to do, how to proceed. We were just trying to figure out what was going to happen, the next steps. And so we we come to find out that, you know, then we hear um, another breaking news where there's a bomb on a bus and it, the, the bomb had exploded. And we we automatically just went from, you know, we have these different force protection conditions that depend on how we have the security measures at the base. Well, the different bases. Um, where I was in London, we had about four different bases, including our housing but we automatically locked them down. I, I had to, I was in charge of recalling everybody to, to get everybody going. Communications were very sparse because we were in the middle of this terrorism attack. Um, and 52 people did lose their lives. Hundreds were injured. Fortunately, as I mean, even to this day, as far as I know, nobody in the military that I was serving with on that, on our base was harmed. However, one of the two um, bombs was within miles of where my barracks were at. So just very devastating. But, you know, we, we recoup as we do. We supported each other as we always have and moving on, right? 
So after I left, I left um, London a couple months after that in October. Okay, and then I was stationed in Jacksonville, Florida, and I was at the Hilo Squadron, and I went on the U.S. Roosevelt. Unfortunately, I got injured on the Roosevelt, and I was sent back to security at the NAS Jacksonville there, where I was placed into a dispatching position, and then I was also in the investigations office. And my time in service came up. I was married to another um, service member at the time, and my last day came, and my my supervisor was a civilian. He comes downstairs, and he's like, very lovely to work with you. Have a great time in your life, whatever your next endeavor is, and I was lost. Like, what? I'm done? Like, I mean, I knew this day was coming. I woke up that morning. I put my uniform on. I was ready to go to work, and it was my last day in the Navy, and the whole world was open to me, right? And so I go and I leave and I, I, it was, it was a huge transition, a huge transition indeed. So just a little, again, a little brief story about my time in the service. Like I said, I was married to a, um, a mil an active duty um, sailor as, as well. Um, when we first met, he was getting ready to go on a six month deployment to Kuwait he came back, then he went on another six month deploy to, a deployment to Iraq, and then he came back and then he was on another deployment to Gitmo. So I was active duty military, I was a veteran, I was a spouse of a vet of a military, active duty deployed um, military personnel and a lot of things, a lot of things. So again, just a brief introduction to who I am. So again, why does all this matter? Just again, the transition, the changes, we go from a lot of freedom of growing up and, you know, going to school and having some sort of routine and schedule there to going into the military. Military personnel have so many different reasons why they join the military. Oh, many of them are selfless, right? I mean, of course, they're traveling and, you know, some of the benefits are always really nice and fancy and shiny. But at the end of the day, that's not the reasons why we join. Uh, per the, and then, so then we go in the military and then we work on getting out. Per the Department of Veterans Affairs, as of 2022, it is estimated that 250,000 service members leave the military each year. Um, and so then whenever they do that, we have to transition and figure out things like, well, where am I going next with my job? What, what do my finances look like? Because now I don't have a paycheck on the 1st and the 15th. What about my health insurance? Because I don't have, you know, the health insurance and my family doesn't have health insurance anymore. Relationships. We know that military relationships are, are very difficult because there is a lot of changes and you're changing duty stations um, every couple of years. What does my mental health look like? Because all of the things Afro mentioned have an impact on mental health. Approximately 43 million veterans, family members, survivors, and caregivers are in the United States today. In 2020, approximately 5.2 million veterans experienced a mental health condition. Over half of them have not engaged in any kind of treatment. This is again why I'm here, to talk to you, to educate you, to provide you with some of these resources. It is so imperative. Military culture is very different than what we would call civilian culture of people who've never experienced military life. We're taught to be strong. We're taught to be warriors. We're taught to stuff it down. We're taught to, hey, we're mission task oriented. Let me just get through this day. Let me just get through this task. Oh, my mental health can wait. My self-care can wait. My family. I can't even put my family first. I have to put the military first. You've learned that in boot camp. Your family didn't come in a sea bag. That's it, military first. So it's just really interesting how when we get out of the military, some of that stuff is just still forefront in our minds. I can't talk to you about mental health. I can't talk to you about being vulnerable because where's the stigma, right? The stigma is there. We assume it's there. So again, just kind of a review. Again, 250 service members separate each year. 43 million veterans within the United States. It is estimated that 16.8 veterans complete suicide per day. I know 16.8 is not a whole number. They take an average. They, they, they do the average. I, I don't do math. 
they did that. That's just this, I have a, um, a resource that I would love to share with you. It's actually in my PowerPoint. And if you click on the link when I share the, the PowerPoint with you, you can take you right to the information. 47% of veterans who have been deployed to war zones have identified symptoms of PTSD or depression, but they don't seek support. Average wait time at a VA treatment facility is 18 days if you're not in a crisis. An average distance between veterans, so the 43 million veterans and caregivers and uh, survivors and supports, have a VA resource within 15 miles United nationwide. There's so, so many veteran resources in every community. It is phenomenal. It's, oh, it's such a good, overwhelming feeling to know that the support is there. But sometimes the information is just not globally shared. Um, I am, I, I am going to put this in here. In a crisis, please make sure we're calling 988. The prompts will say, hey, press one. You can text 988 um, for civilians. And they can just they'll talk to you through it. But if you text them, they will come back and say, hey, if you're a veteran, please text this crisis line, 838255. If you would like to program that in your phone, I think that might be appropriate to potentially help out with a veteran that you are working with, or if you're a veteran yourself, crisis line is not 911 knocking at your door. Veterans crisis line is somebody who can be there to support you when you you, can, you don't have words to say, or you're, you're, you're trying to make a, a permanent decision on a temporary emotion. That is what these programs are here for. I do just kind of want to go in and, and chit chat a little bit about the transition assistive, assistance program. So 365 days, one year prior to a, um, a military separating, um, they go through this program called TAP. And you know, they are, are doing the best that they can to ensure that the transition is um, as supportive as possible, because again, you have all of these expectations of your daily routine being a military personnel, and then when you're leaving, you have all this freedom. It is, they are trying to do the best they can to make it mandatory. However, there are some jobs that you just can't you can't do this, especially if you're on a deployment status. So they have adopted this program called eLearn, Tap eLearning. And TAP eLearning um, is the TAP program. It's just a one-day course, but it, it also has a series of other classes that you can take. And you you get to talk with a, a, a counselor there, and they can help you find, you know, how, which direction to go for yourself. Teams. Um, the transition employment for military spouses is um, to assist military spouses and caregivers as a plan as they plan to prepare for their job um, and employment goals. So they help with uh, resume building, they help with salary negotiations and federal hiring because if you want to get out of the military and go for a federal job, there's a whole what to do process to deal with that. Um, they also help sharpen some of your interview skills. Um, the ENPP, which is Employment Navigator Partnership Pilot. Again, this is for veterans and military personnel who they, uh, they it's kind of like a career assessment. What do you want to do? What skills are you doing? Sometimes the job in the military doesn't necessarily translate to a job in the civilian world. And so what skills have you learned in the military that you can transfer to the civilian world? Um, sometimes people find that they don't want to do the job that they did in the military and they want to do something different. And these are ways that we can find, identify like necessary credentialing programs and, you know, market information to try to help figure out how to get there. Then they have uh, the off base training um, or transition training. And again, that's uh, workshops off base to help military members meet employment goals. And then the vet's guide, again, so these are all links. When you get the presentation, you can just click on it. Also, at the very end, there is a second place for you guys to get all this information. The vet's guide is, is it is what it is. It's like 300 pages of a resource guide to help with finding community resources for the veterans.
EFCT, which is Employment Fundamentals of Career Transition. So day one of the workshop, the, it's, it's, sorry, it's one day workshop for post-separation career options to help benefit. Then we have the Wounded Warrior and Caregiver Employment Workshop. So sometimes, you know, there's some different types of discharges that um, some of the members get that they don't actually get to qualify for certain transitional assistance programs because the medical boards are just so fast with trying to get you out so that you can get your medical care met, your medical care needs met. So um, the Wounded Warrior and Caregiver Employment Workshop helps you find and navigate the resources to meet the requirement for um, the TAP program. Department of Labor Employment Workshop material. So again, this is an additional workshop, helps with resumes, and then um, the career explore, uh, it's career and credential exploration, C2E. I didn't put that acronym in there. Um, it's just, again, another personal personalized career assessment. And then there's VA career counseling, and then some restrictions apply with that. So just be mindful of that. So there, are, so just a, a one resource for our local community here in, in the Kansas City area is the VCP program, Veteran Community Partnerships. And again, just if you're out of the military, you you feel like your transition wasn't preparing you enough for support to transition to a, a, your civilian lifestyle, and you're still lost or still confused. This is a great resource for you to co contact in. Um, now, VCP is not but is not local in Kansas City. They do have the closest workshop is in Wichita, Kansas. They are doing a initiative in hopes to expand in 2024, and we're hoping that it can happen in the Kansas City area. Oops, sorry, I think I pushed. Okay, there we go. I want to chit chat a little bit about separation. If you are a caregiver or um, a displaced veteran or a family member of somebody who has uh, passed away as a uh, has a veteran passed away and you need access to certain benefits that they have, this is every member will get one of these. It is called a DD two fourteen. Now this there's two different types of the DD two fourteen. There is a member one which you'll see at the bottom right hand corner. There's also a member four. Now the member one ha it has um, spaces for 22 different entries. The member four has for 30 different entries. And so the, the number four will talk, talk about the different types of separation. And then it talks about your eligibility for reenlistment. And why are those important? Because if you have type of separation you have allows your eligibility for um, benefits like the GI Bill, for VA healthcare, disability compensation, state tax or state property tax exemption. Missouri does not honor that, by the way. Um, and then VA backed mortgage and home loans, federal and state hiring preferences, um, and just other different benefits. If you do not have a copy of your DD 214, or if you're working with somebody who doesn't have one, again, it is very important because you never know what benefits that somebody's missing out on. You can go here and request a copy of it. So just again, reviewing some of the different types of transitions or discharges. So we have an honorable discharge, which means you completed your terms of service and your character was considered honorable. There's a general discharge, which could be a general discharge code on your member four of your DD-214. And most of your service was okay per the explanation of what it meant. And but that you, there were some problems, but you're still entitled to some benefits. Other than honorable, they put this in quotes that bad paper discharge, or you were quote unquote fired from the military. However, you did not have to face with what well, the military judicial system is court martial. Um, there was some mis misconduct, maybe some drug use, fighting, abusive position, or disobeying an order. And then we have bad conduct, conduct discharge, and um, there may be punitive discharges. Um, it can be um, maybe punishment by military court martial or serious offenses following um, a guilty military. If, um, like say, if you're guilty, you you say you're guilty or you're found guilty. 
Um, a dishonorable discharge is given as a punishment for serious offenses at a felony level. Um, and this is either if you're in, if you're out in the community in the civilian jurisdiction or military. If you're active duty military, typically military overshadows anything civilian. Because again, when they say you're property of the military, I mean, that's kind of what you are. <laughs> Um, then there's an officer discharge. It's commissioned officer cannot receive a bad, come discharge, a bad conduct discharge or dishonorable. So the, the equivalent would be just an, honor, an officer discharge. And then they have um, medical discharges and then they have an entry level discharge. So if a service member who has not had 180 days in service, um, then they'll just have a medical or an entry level discharge. And sometimes that, does, that doesn't necessarily make them eligible for benefits. But again, they have different career counselors at the VA that can help you determine and decipher all of the information that I said. If you are, I didn't put the different types of discharge necessarily in the slides, but it is in my notes. So if you, when you get the copy of the slides, you will have all this information in your notes. I love the colors. So this is a beautiful slide. Um, some more stats, one in, vo in four veterans show signs of serious mental illness, four, in five, four of five veterans with a substance use disorder struggle with alcohol. It is estimated that 90% of veterans struggle with a substance use diagnosis. 10% of veterans of the wars of Iraq and um, Afghanistan struggle with drug and alcohol misuse. And, you know, just within the past couple of years, you know, we've had, you know, um, the exit from Afghanistan that was kind of traumatic for our community. PTSD rates um, is 15, higher, 15 times higher than civilians. Depression is up to five times higher than civilians. More than eight, 185,000 veterans have been diagnosed with a TBI. Now, the TBI is, is actually the injury, the brain injury. The symptoms are very similar to, you know, what, it, what PTSD looks like. Um, the CDC says that TBI is a disruption in the normal function of the brain that can be caused by a bump, a blow, a jolt um, to the head or a penetrating head injury. Service members and veterans are also at risk for brain injury from explosions ex um, experienced during combat or training exercise. So again, just keeping in mind, 43 million veterans, families, caregivers in the United States, 250,000 of them are separating each year. And then we have these stats right here. What are some good things to keep a lookout for somebody who is transitioning from active um, service to civilian? I mean, and even um, whenever we're dealing with like the National Guard or reservists, because reservists um, are still required to, you know, do one weekend a month, two weekends a year. And that's if they're not activated for whatever the military needs them for. So most veterans go through an adjustment period as everybody does with changes. But it is found that most of them typically find their new roles fulfilling. And for some, the transition can be harder than others and obviously can last for some time, which makes it difficult to enjoy life and the changes that come with that. But some symptoms to look out for, right? Frequently feeling on edge or having a lot of tenseness in their body, having difficulty concentrating, angry or irritable, trouble sleeping, and feeling down for weeks or months. Now, again, I know that I've chit-chatted a little bit about military culture and how it is a little bit different, but if you ask us how we're doing and if you can support us, I promise you that we may not always have an answer, but we're humans and we we love to you know, know that we are supported by you and our family and our friends. So totally welcome. Hey, I see that you're struggling with the transition. Is there any way that I can help you teach you how to cook a meal or buy your, whatever, you know, I don't know anything. This is some positive note though. I, I found um, this transition.military transition.org. So time between the last day in the military and the first day in a civilian position 
we um, have the people that were told 30% so that they had a, a job already lined up before they transitioned. 21% um, said that between one and four months, you know, they, they found a job. And then, you know, kind of lower between five and six months. And then um, less than a month, more than a year. And then between seven months and a year is 8% of veterans who um, transition out. And then 1% just preferred not to answer. Are you happier now compared to when you were in the military? 36% of the people told said yes. I am happier now. 35% said my happiness is about the same. 24% no, I was happier in the military. And then again, you have some people who just don't want to participate. That's okay. Um, transition additional information, 48% um, of the veterans indicate that their transition was a little more difficult than expected. Hey, for me, like my story, I, my last day happened and I was like, oh my, my goodness, what do I do now? I did have a job lined up. Unfortunately, it was not for me. 76% um, of veterans agree that um, their transition felt pretty successful. And 52% um, agree that their transition was confusing. So, you know, again, there's a lot of hope. There's a lot of preparation that, you know, is, is helpful and, and suggested to help these transitions. Again, sometimes we have the mental health that just really impacts us. It really just stops us from being able to function at full capacity and, and again, manage our daily living activities and even engage with our family members. And, and again, if so if you go and you ask your friend or family member, hey, how can I help you with your transition? I can see there's a little bit of irritability and sometimes we don't know. Sometimes I don't know the answer. You know, just just like anybody else who, you know, we we learned that again, I'm strong, I'm tough, I'm gonna grin and bear it, I'm gonna drink some water and move on. I'm I'm not even gonna sit here and focus on on whatever my mental health looks like. So, you know, I would like to bring in like what some kind of what symptoms of different mental health looks like. Um, I know some of us are professionals and they know, and this might be a repeat, but some of us don't know. And I just want to want to share some of those symptoms with you. So PTSD, I know that this looks really big and wordy and maybe confusing, but that's kind of the point I wanted to get across. Because when you struggle with post-traumatic stress disorder, it is forefront in your life. It is forefront in your mind and in the way that you live life and the way that you do your daily tasks. And sometimes it's so big and it's so real. I can't see anything past what it is that's just going on in my symptoms. But the good news is, is there is treatment for PTSD. Treat PTSD is manageable if you will do the work. A little bit of history, PTSD um, was officially recognized and codified in the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders, which is what clinicians and doctors use to um, make the um, appropriate diagnosis. This happened in 1980, um, aftermath of the Vietnam War. Terms like soldier's heart during Civil War, shell shock, which I don't know if you guys have heard these terms before, um, in the First World War and combat fatigue um, around the Vietnam War. Uh, so secondhand exposure, such as even even so even hearing about the war and the, the pain and the trauma that somebody has been through can also lead to PTSD. So it's not like I had I didn't have to directly experience some of the war. I could just hear about it. Um, PTSD symptoms we know can, can significantly disrupt interpersonal and occupational functioning and manifest in very different ways. So again, very for, forefront, we got the emotional, psychological, behavior, and cognitive aspects of what PTSD can in. Depression, signs that we can look for depression, a depressed mood, a loss of interest, dealing with insomnia, weight loss, weight gain, you know, we got the psychomotor agitation, which is where I can't sit still. Maybe I'm shaking my leg. Maybe I'm shaking my hands. I just, I'm really struggling. My anxiety is going through the roof and I'm just not, I'm not well. Um, fatigue, reduced ability, concentrate, the feelings of worthlessness and thoughts of suicide. Um, factors 
such as separation from loved ones and support systems, stressors, deployment, combat, all in the experience of witnessing um, oneself and others in harm's way can all contribute to an increased risk of depression in both active duty and veteran populations. Substance use disorders um, in the military, a veteran and veteran populations, alcohol use disorders are the most prevalent substance use disorders. Military personnel who experience more combat and higher rates of problematic drinking than their peers. Smoking is more common in veterans than age matched civilians. And the percentage of VA opioid prescriptions have increased over the last 20 years. And among veterans, marijuana is the most commonly used illicit drug. And as it becomes more um, legalized and accepted in our different communities and, and states, I'm only assuming that that will increase. So the military is trying to take a stance of, hey, this is becoming a problem. How can we address this without doing the shame and not making it a sign of weakness? So suicide uh, statistics, just kind of go, doing um, a repeat of what I chit-chatted a little bit earlier. They have increased over the last 20 years and exceed the current civilian life, or civilian rate, excuse me. Uh, within the military service in 2020, the VA reported that there were 6,146 veteran suicides or 16.8 deaths per year. Again, I said the math. It's just the math. I know it's not a whole number. However, in 2020, there were 343 fewer veteran suicides than in 2019, and the number of veteran suicides was lower each, lower than each year prior, prior year since 2006. Forgive me in my wording. <laughs> in 2020, adjusting for the population age and sex differences, the suicide rates for veterans was 57.3% greater than non-veteran U.S. adults. So again, the resources are there. If you are having thoughts of suicide, there's the Veterans Crisis Line. Um, it again is available 24 seven. You can dial 988 or press one, and then, or you can do the texting, the 838-255. What if you're hanging around a veteran and they say these things? I wish I could go to sleep and not wake up. If I were here, my family would, my, if I weren't here, my family would be better off. If I claim, if my claim doesn't go through, I'm done, you know, for the BA benefits. If I can't get through this pain, I might as well just shoot myself. Again, I, you know, just remain calm. The VA has adopted a program called SAVE Training. I'm not telling you to go and do the SAVE Training, but I'm just letting you know that they were pretty interesting ways to kind of um, address it. Hey, know the signs. Hey, you're saying these things. Are you, you can ask, are you okay? Are you thinking of killing yourself? You know, the studies say that if you ask that, that's not gonna make somebody go out and, and complete suicide. It is actually just more of an awareness. Oh my gosh, maybe I am, right? It, it, it just being open and authentic and empathetic to what's going on with this person validate them. Hey, man, I, I hear you. I know that you're not doing well. Um, encourage treatment, expedite getting help. Hey, can, can I help you dial this number? Can I take you to a facility? What, how can I do, what can I do to support you? Right? So, um, I, I encourage you, please don't argue with somebody. What do you, you know, don't make judgmental comments. Um, you know, make sure you're, you know, just trying to understand that there's no quick fixes, no, there's no quick solutions. What can, how, again, how, just how can I be here to help, right? Um, so these are a few more statistics. So in 2022, this came out, I have the link to it. Um, for time's sake, I'm just gonna kind of breeze through it a little bit. Um, there, there, so suicide rates were up in about 2016, 2017. There has been a lot of um, disclosure about the mental health impact um, and the substance use has increased and suicides with veterans have increased and they also have suicide, uh, uh, so sorry, um, a substance use disorder as well. 
the VA, the Veterans Health Administration, is trying to make um, access to support and mental health a priority. Um, and and they, you know, suicide is 100%. I mean, it is preventable. Um, again, just trying to identify some of the the. Um, oh my goodness, I'm trying to find my words. I'm getting tongue tied. Excuse me. <laughs> Um, just some of the ways that, um, you know, suicide is completed over the several, past several years. Um, the last statistic here is 42% of the veterans who died from suicide in 2020 did not have a documented mental health or substance use diagnosis. So they're there. And again, access to these support systems and treatment facilities are available because again, going back up to my, my statistic referring to what I said, there is a resource within 15 miles state, I mean, in the, in the whole United States. Suicide rates among veterans and mental health or substance use disorders fell um, from 77 to 55. So that's the statistic that um, I was trying to share with you earlier. Overall, why suicide rates fell from 2019 through 2020, those with mental health or substance use rates rose um, with those with um, any substance use disorders. Again, to save time, this information is here. The reference was, is here in the, um, the reference material. Transitions into our community from, again, military to our community, homelessness can be a, a, an issue. It can be something that can definitely impact our mental health or maybe our impact has, our mental health has impacted the way that we, you know, try to protect ourselves with our basic needs of having a home. So we, the VA is committed to ending homelessness among um, veterans. And um, so this is the the helpline for that, there's a website here. Locally here in Kansas City, there is a Veterans Community Project. I don't know if you guys know, uh, several years ago, I think it was like 2017 or 18, there was a program where they would build tiny houses for homeless veterans. And that's what this program is. Um, they are partnered with um, with the VA and, and with an innovative action-minded organizations to resolve and the stand-in gap to ensure veterans, you know, they live with dignity and honor. And, and able to live in a home. So this is a great website or a great resource. So then the website is here. And then the bottom one again is the community project resource. LGBTQ veterans who choose VA to receive affirming care services. Um, if you call a local care coordinator, you can um, get in for the support that you need. A lot of really good services and supports here. You can use a QR code QR code on your phone and it'll take you right to the website. So kind of going back to a little bit of um, the discharges. So there are some types of discharges that don't make veterans eligible for certain um, benefits through the VA. And um, so I've had a lot of questions about well, what do we do? How can we support a veteran who has a dishonorable discharge or um, anything that is not honorable or other than honorable or the general? Because even though some of the, like most of those discharge types still are um, make you eligible for receiving certain benefits, some of them aren't. But there are some amazing community supports here. And I had the opportunity to speak with Warriors Ascent and um, also the Battle Within. And I'm going to get to them in a minute. But Warriors Ascent is an amazing program uh, for veterans and first responders. Um, they have a treatment recovery. Now, you see that I have PTS and then D. So they don't. you don't necessarily have to have a diagnosis of PTSD to go through this program. Um, but you just have to have symptoms, but their goal is providing hope and healing. They have over, they've helped over 500 veterans and first responders um, in this five day program. It's called the Academy of Healing. They also have a podcast that potentially could speak to your heart um, for things and topics that 
you know, you might be struggling with. Website is here, warriorsascent.org. Uh, the Battle Within, um, again, is for veterans, first responders. Recently, they um, have opened it up to frontline medical staff, male and female. So if you're in the ER working through COVID stuff and you're struggling with uh, PTS or PTSD symptoms, reach out, see if you can connect. Their program is called a Revenant Journey. It's a five-day program. They're affiliated with Warrior, KC Warrior Coalition. And the Warrior Coalition, when you click on the link, there's a whole bunch of um, additional resources. Um, so I was able to talk with um, several people who support the battle within and, you know, they they really kind of wanted to just really press that. They really um, honor the stories and are looking forward to some of the transformations that this program brings. And they believe that therapy is vital to the, pro the healing process. They do offer therapy referrals. So they are a connection with Frontline Therapy Network. NAMI is amazing. They have online support groups. Um, they have, fat, they've done this thing with NAMI Homefront. They have counselors through a program called Military One Source, and that's their phone number. They also help with connecting you to primary care providers um, and then behavioral health providers. Some veterans just don't want anything to do with the VA, and that's okay. They don't want anything to do with the military life. They don't want anything, they, they're done, they've finished. They don't want anything to do with it. So that's okay. But if you can at least acknowledge that you need some additional support, NAMI Homefront could be a great way to, you know, still be connected to brothers and sisters in the military who you served with, you know, for some of the camaraderie and still get the services that you need. They also have the um, NAMI Family Supports. Now, these groups are led by family members of active military and veterans with mental conditions too. So, you know, they're trained professionals, but then also have firsthand experience. So again, some more advice, you know, for successful transition, starting early again, which is encouraged and, you know, requested to be a requirement, having a transition plan, building up your network. Some, you know, I got out of the military when I was stationed in Florida. My hometown is in Kansas City, Missouri. I mean, the military does a really good job of, you know, being able to move me back to my home of record. But, you know, I, like I said, I was married, so we, I stayed there. But what does my network look like after I get out? Um, again, learning to translate my skills, which is a lot of what those uh, assessments, the personalized, individualized assessments would do, would help me figure out my job duties and how can they translate to the real, real world, civilian world. And then just be patient. Patience. Oh, patience. <laughs> Some good self-care um, things that we can consider whenever we're transitioning. Again, I, I have a few more slides left. I'm just going to breeze past this. Again, so for National Guard members and reservists, again, one week in a month, two weeks a year. And then if you're identified for a billet to potentially go overseas or be um, oh, longer, I mean, it could be a year, two years, you know, whatever the needs of the military are at that point. Um, just make sure that so your job, your civilian job is required by law to hold your position. However, that doesn't mean that your tasks and duties go on hold for the time that you're gone. So somebody might fill in and your job responsibilities and duties might have changed. You might be into new projects or your old projects might be, have ended. So there's going to be, again, the, the pitch changes. That word just keeps coming up, right? <laughs> So just making sure that you know you're heavily in support with your talking to your supervisor and your coworkers. The VA App Store, my goodness, there is so many amazing resources here. Um, I have personally used several of these. Um, I have the Military Sesame Street. There's a website that kind of chit chats and educates children on a on a kid level of understanding kind of the changes that's going on. They have um, discussions about what deployment looks like, what transitioning looks like, what a whole bunch of different things. Um, there's a PTSD coach online. Wonderful. I mean, it's so wonderful and supportive. And I click on it sometimes and it says, hey, how you feeling? Here's a thermometer on one to 10. What's going on? And then 
sometimes it will say, why don't you just go outside and listen to the birds? And I'm like, oh my gosh, it's so simple, a coping skill that I, I can't think of right now because sometimes again, my brain is not functioning because, you know, the PTSD stuff is just fighting. So again, a perfect time to say thank you veterans for all of the things that you have done and for your sacrifice. I do want to mention if you say thank you to a veteran or an active duty member or maybe a family member who has lost somebody, sometimes we don't know how to respond to that. Sometimes it might be a smile or a, okay, I'm just going to pretend I didn't hear you. Or maybe they'll say thanks, or maybe they don't know what to say. But I just want you to know that when you say thank you for me, I want to say thank you. It was an honor for me to serve. Um, and it kind of sparks a little joy in my heart to know that there is some gratitude out there. Um, hit a little bit of history. Um, November 11th, 1918 was the day that World War I ended. And it was a year later, um, President Wilson declared it um, Armistice Day, um, which later trans transitioned to a just a veteran's holiday. So after World War II, the holiday was recognized as a day to tribute veterans of both wars, World War I and II. And then the beginning of 1954, the United States designated November 11th as Veterans Day to honor veterans of all US wars. So just a little bit of history. Maybe you can share that with somebody on Saturday. These are some... Oh, I was yeah. say, we, we're about at the 10 minute mark. So okay. I'm yeah. ready to take some questions. I will just remind everybody that we will be sending this PowerPoint out with all these. And, and as Autumn said, all of it's uh, there for you to actually click on the links and go to the various websites and stuff. We will be mailing it out to the list of people who signed up for this webinar. And also I'm gonna pop in the chat real quick, um, the link to the uh, certificate of attendance for this and the password to access that. So if you um, want that for any reason, then that is available. There is one question that has been popped in the chat and it is what are the differences in terms of experiences, if any, in terms of gender um, in, in what you've been talking about? Um. <sighs> That's a kind of a loaded question. The differences in service for the so for gender specific. So yes, um, you know, and and I was also a police officer. So I in boot camp we were separated, you know, women male or male and female um, on our barracks, obviously. But then when we do our daily things, we would you know kind of commingle, and then. Um, through the training, they try to do the best that they could to keep us separated, you know, in our, our dorms and everything. And then when we're out, you know, doing our jobs. So again, as a police officer, I think there was a total of maybe five women in my police precinct um, in London. I mean, and there was a lot of males there. It was pretty, it was, it was not a huge precinct, but I mean, so, I mean, there there is a, a difference, um, but you learn, you learn to kind of just mesh, right? You, we, we learned, I really enjoyed my service. I really enjoyed getting to know all the different um, cultures. I mean, my goodness, it was so exciting just learning from where everybody was from. That's a good question. Yes, there is a, there is a, a difference. <laughs> you know, and I don't need, need to put you on the spot with this. Sure. But, um, as far as the percentages of um, male versus female when it comes to experiencing and reporting PTSD? Are the percentages of people who experience that about the same or? You know, I I didn't necessarily get into that. Um, the, 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 there is a resource link and it does kind of break it down between age groups and male, female. There is a different, there there is another initiative um, and it's military sexual trauma. And it is, there is a whole department supporting women and their trauma associated with military trauma. Men also experience military sexual trauma, but um, it is identified that, yes, it is a problem for women in the military who struggle with PTSD symptoms. I wanted to ask you, um, 
when you look at the, the, that slide where you showed, you know, your picture and stuff, I know I've been married for a long time. And I, when I look back at the pictures of, of my wife and I, when we got married, we look like a couple five-year-olds that I can't believe anybody let us actually get married. When you see your picture that young, um, does it just surprise you that you, they were that, how long young you looked and you were actually going into the military? Going into the military, making big girl decisions. Yes. It, you know, I, I look at my smile and how my smile has changed, you know, just from, and I, you know, there's sometimes I look at that picture and I'm like, oh my goodness, if I could just tell you one thing, you know, one thing, what can I tell you? You know? Yeah. So yeah, the difference is it definitely feels like a different life. I'm sure it does. I was curious because of to the, I mean, it's been a while now, but there's, it's still, I consider it a fairly recent development where they've, you know, studied brain health and kind of determined that, you know, adolescence doesn't really end at 18. It's, it's later into the twenties where, you know, young adults brains are still forming and things are still doing it. So I've, I wonder if there's anything that studies that have been done about how that is affected with joining something like the military and, and having that much, much structure. And then, like you said, the, the change to suddenly not having that kind of structure in your life. I mean, you can put that structure in your own life, but I imagine it must be really hard to go from a place where you don't necessarily have to rely only on yourself to put structure in your life. It's there, whether you want it or not. And then suddenly you just have tons of freedom to go wherever you want. You mentioned feeling lost and I imagine that's probably pretty common. Oh, yes, absolutely. Well, and, you know, kind of going back to the brain development um, stuff. Yes. So, you know, I, I think studies now are saying that the brain's not fully developed till 29 and my goodness, where I was 19 when I joined and, you know, men and young, young, young men join and go to war and, you know, they part of TBI traumatic brain injury is part of the explosions. And when you're forefront front lines in the war situations, some of that stuff is impacting you and you're, and you got the traumatic brain injury and then you have, and we know TBI really just kind of unfortunately changes your personality because there's some, again, it's just so loud and forefront. So, you know, this is another reason why sometimes the care is so important and the resources and the support, you know, I can't tell myself and my clients enough that, having a support system to help you when you're not okay is really one of the most important things. We're not meant to do this life alone. We're not meant to heal alone. We're not meant to nothing alone. It's actually a basic need. <laughs> um, I, I noticed your, your comment, Gail, about thanking Autumn and also just mentioning that it could have been longer. I know it is a struggle sometimes for us to do just an hour and to build Q and A in. Um, just from experience, doing it over a lunch hour and keeping it keeping it limited in the amount of time we all have really busy work days is you know there's there's negatives to it certainly the positives are just being able to not only um hopefully have the time where participants can come but also you know every everyone who speaks for us is also working um too so usually we're asking our, our speakers to just give up hopefully their lunch hour but not um interrupt their day too much so yeah so it, it would not be nice and Maybe Autumn will apply to be one of our speakers at the next Mental Health KC conference and have a little bit more time. <laughs> so. Hey, you know what? If I can be out there to support my brothers and my sisters again, I am just, I cannot express my passion enough for this topic. And just, you know, I think I said earlier, I don't know if I said earlier here, um, if you want a history lesson, anybody's welcome in the Kansas City VA hospital go sit in the waiting room, go have a discussion with a veteran. So cool. All right. Well, we're rolling up to the end. Um, I will just remind everybody, if, if you have questions, if uh, we'll, as quickly as we can, we'll get this, this sent out. Um, there, a reminder that there will, um, the webinar also will be available on the mentalhealthkc.com website. Um, here shortly so that you can rewatch it if you want to do so or share it with anybody. And if you have any questions, there's an, an info at email on that that goes to one of our main committee members. So certainly if if some time has passed and for some reason you haven't got this, this um, presentation material, certainly shoot us a message. Um, 
you know, we'll do whatever we can to make sure that we're, we're getting you uh, the resources that you need. And I just want to thank all of you for being here. And Me too. And thank Autumn for speaking to us. And with that, I'm going to close us out and just uh, invite you to get back to your day. And please just, uh, I want to reiterate, uh, reiterate what Autumn said um, about asking people questions. Don't be afraid to ask people questions, very serious questions. You know, if there's a difference between asking somebody how they're, how they're doing and they say fine and you just walk away uh, versus asking very specific questions. And it's important because um, it saves lives. So I just wanted to reiterate that. That was a very important point that she made. So thank you, everybody. And thank you, Autumn. Thank you, everybody, for coming and spending your afternoon with me. Thank you. Bye, everybody.